for having me here today. This is indeed a beautiful venue, and it is a wonderful treat to be off Wi-Fi, although I admit it gave me a bit of anxiety um, at first. I want to thank the SBA and ICA for inviting us here to speak, the Center for Business History, and the City of Stockholm for being our hosts. My name is Catherine Marr. I'm the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation, and I'm here to talk to you about something radical today, which is the value of openness and the importance that it has within our societies. I suspect that each of you has that value within you, and I'm here to talk about why it's important for your institutions and for our shared collective history. And if there's one thing that I hope you take home with you, it is a thought and inspiration on how you might yourselves, as institutions, as corporations, think about opening your records and your histories to share with the world. So, in praise of open. And who am I to talk about it? Well, you might know a little bit about Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia is one of the world's most beloved and popular websites today. We serve many people from all over the globe, um, and open is who we are. It is core part of our values, free, open, and transparent. It's one of the reasons we believe that so many people use and love us today. At the same time, it wasn't always easy being open, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in hope that it can provide some context for our, my request to you. So our belief is in free knowledge. Our vision statement is a world in which every single human can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. We do this because we believe it is actually the way to make the world a better place. Since 2001, we have passionate contributors who have been documenting the world, and we will continue to do so until we run out of things to write about. In 16 years, we've made tremendous progress. We exist in nearly 300 languages. There are more than 40 million articles across all of Wikipedia's different languages, and people have made more than 3 billion edits to our sites over time. We have institutional partners and allies across the world, from Europeana, Europeana which is the European um, Digital Heritage and Cultural Agency, to the British Museum, the world's largest encyclopedic museum, to the US National Archives. And they have helped join us in their, our mission to make the world more open by joining their mission with ours and sharing their information and content. We are made possible by people. Uh, this photograph was actually taken in Berlin just last week, and it includes many of our community members from around the globe, from Nigeria to Mexico, from Germany to Sweden, from Korea to Argentina. And all of these different individuals represent hundreds of affiliates. In fact, I imagine that they have a local organization in every country that is represented here today. They're the people who make Wikipedia possible. And they do it for the world. Every single month, we receive visits from more than a billion unique devices. That means that we're serving almost every single planet, or every single planet, I wish that that was the case, <laughs> every single corner of the planet in all sorts of different languages, from here in Stockholm to McMurdo Station in Antarctica, um, from small villages in India all the way to rural parts of Venezuela. This is who we are and this is who we do it for. And as it turns out, we really are making an incredible difference in terms of distributing this information. And as I mentioned, it's all free and open. It's free to share, it's free to remix, it's free to reuse. In fact, if you wanted to sell Wikipedia, you could. You could box it up, you could put it on a DVD, you could make it into a set of books. That's just part of who we are. I don't know anyone who's done that successfully, but the idea is there, and we think that that's a critical part of what might actually makes us valuable. In fact, every image that you've seen so far in my presentation and every image that you'll continue to see, it comes from Wikimedia Commons, which is our image repository of 38 million free images globally. Um, it helps us understand and share and illustrate our world. We, why do we do it? We do it because we believe it makes the world better. We're not actually here to write an encyclopedia, although we are in the business of writing an encyclopedia. We're here because we believe that free knowledge is something that is a net good for society. We believe that there's a space for a public park, an institute of higher education and learning, lifelong learning, if you will, that belongs to all of us. We believe that it creates opportunities for education, makes it more equitable and accessible for all people. We believe that it makes societies more informed and allows us to have higher levels of discourse. 
We believe that it makes, creates opportunities for greater sustainability and entrepreneurship and opportunity. In fact, I've actually met people who have been hired for jobs after doing research based on what exists on Wikipedia. We know that it's real. And we believe that it makes our societies more open and democratic. And as you heard from our opening speakers today, this is a value that I think many of us share and increasingly feel is something that's critically important, that we have the facts to make good decisions for ourselves. But as I said, we didn't start out this way. In fact, Wikipedia initially started out as a fairly traditional encyclopedia with a fairly top-down model of editorial control. And it was a conscious choice to do something different. And it was a little scary. We didn't really know how we were going to survive. We didn't know if the project was going to be successful at all. In fact, many of you probably remember those days. The idea of thinking that an encyclopedia on the internet that anybody could edit was possibly one of the craziest ideas you had ever heard. And there was no way that it would ever be used or trusted because how could it possibly work? So it was very much a leap of faith to get us where we are today. And that's why I want to encourage all of us to take that leap of faith, because I think that it is one of those things that while you pass through that journey of openness and that fear of openness or the risks of openness, ultimately it makes you stronger. So why should you do that? Because we believe that it is the right thing and it is the smart thing and it is the enduring thing. So I'm gonna start with why I think it's the right thing and then I'll actually talk about why I think it's smart and ultimately in your interests and how I think it will actually allow you to endure and your stories to endure over time. Why is it the right thing? It's the right thing because our history of our societies and our shared human culture has historically been greater when we share than when we contain. There has always been a tension about the way that knowledge is managed and the power that knowledge has. Holding on to knowledge has made kingdoms rich, but sharing knowledge has made culture even richer. It has made our societies wealthier, more prosperous, and more stable. It is true that if we knew the maps of the constellations, we could out-navigate our competitors, but if we actually know the basis of science and inquiry and physical health, we can all be more prosperous and better positioned to survive. And your legacies are our histories. They are intertwined with the societies that we build. Your companies have built our cultures, they have built nations, they have built cities, they have built history. We learn from you and we have much more to learn from you and I'm not sure that everyone fully appreciates the role that you have played. And so openness is an opportunity to both share that role but also embrace that responsibility as well and become leaders for the future in the conversation. There is strength in our history. This image actually uh, comes from, I believe, a, yeah, I'm looking at Anders and he's agreeing. Um, this image comes from a recent initiative here in Sweden to show the story of what immigrants have contributed to Sweden over time. I believe these are Italian immigrants uh, who came to, oh, yes, I'm getting nods, excellent. Um, I like having my facts correct. That's a very Wikipedia way of doing things. Um, these are Italian immigrants who came to Sweden and joined in the building of the Swedish economy. So there is great value in our history and in sharing these stories so that we can demonstrate the way that we've contributed to societies to make them stronger and better over time. Of course, there is shame in our histories as well, and confronting that shame can also be powerful. I will tell you that, of course, we know that the more that you can get these darker parts of our history out into the open, the easier it is to have a conversation because ultimately they come out. As societies become more open, the darker aspects of our truths become something that we have to reckon with. And being leaning into that conversation and embracing it can actually be a very powerful thing. It gives us an opportunity to connect our past with our present and our future. And it gives you a way to lead the way forward and help un people understand what it is, the role that you've played, but also help us understand the histories that we've gone through. It's also the smart thing. And I say that because I know that many of you here work very closely with your organization's marketing and, business, marketing and product development. And I want to speak a little bit to the way that some of these processes have changed over time. 
Historically, the business of brand and brand management was very much one of top-down control. It was one of having a very clear position in the market. Today, we know that with the diffusion of the way that information is shared and digital culture, consumers are actually people who help create your brand and help design and design and advance what its values are in the world. The brand, the moment it goes out the door, is actually owned by your customers. And so it has become much less like a conductor standing in front of an orchestra and much more like jazz. And so if you think about it in that way, that everything that you put out there is actually an instrument of creativity, wouldn't you want to give the best instruments possible for the most incredible music you could have to assemble that jazz quartet or quintet or orchestra um, in a way that tells the story with that creativity, that remixing, that culture, and that passion, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to tell your story in a more effective way. And you may notice that I haven't shown a single image yet of any brands or any organizations, and there's a reason for that. It's referred to as the black hole of the 20th century. As it turns out, almost everything that exists out there, and probably most of the things in your archives from the past to 75 years, depending on where you are and what jurisdiction you are in, are under control of copyright law. And that is, that is good. Copyright law is designed to incentivize creation, but it also has limitations because it means that many things are missing from our public spaces. It means that many things of your history are not actually there to share. In fact, when I went back to try to find images to be able to share with you, the most recent thing I could find was from the 1930s. And I can tell you that is not the way that your consumers see your brands today. There is a tremendous amount that is missing. And so Europeana, which is one of the partners that I mentioned, has actually done research into this. And they looked at the cultural collections, and of course this is public art as opposed to commercial creativity, and found that only 11% of their whole collection represents things that was made since the 1950s because that is the black hole of the century. And it is stronger in Europe than anywhere else, but it is true globally. And why does this matter? Well, I'm here from Wikipedia, and Wikipedia likes to think of itself as being the place where you go to learn about Plato's cave and about microbiology, but the reality is the number one reason why people come to Wikipedia is because they saw something on television, or they heard something on the radio, or they're, in a, they're in a, having a conversation in a bar and they want to know an answer. There are three reasons why people come. The first is that they saw something on the media. The second is that they want to actually engage in intrinsic learning. And the third is the bar bet. I can tell you, of those three, Two out of three tend to have to do with popular culture, and you are in the business of creating and shaping culture. So here, looking at this image, this comes from, this is a picture of Pokemon. Does anyone know Pokemon? Yes, probably. So Pokemon is famous on Wikipedia because at one point we had 400 articles about every character in the Pokemon universe. We've whittled it down a little bit to some degree of greater notability, but when Pokemon Go launched earlier this year, we saw a 10,000% increase in traffic to our sites, and this is the only image we had to illustrate it that was really available. That's a problem. It's a problem because when people are seeking information, and I can tell you we are the front door to that information, they can't find it. And those images in the commons, the commons is a powerful thing. Those images have been viewed more than 136 billion times last year. So there is a tremendous appetite and audience out there for you. This is an image from the British Museum. I mentioned them earlier as one of our partners. It is the Rosetta Stone. The British Museum went online and they realized that traffic to the Wikipedia page about the Rosetta Stone was five times the traffic to their own websites, and they were missing an opportunity to tell their story by sharing high-quality images of what, of what existed in, within their collections. And in fact, thousands, tens of thousands of items within their collections had no stories. We have a multiplier effect. This is the Royal Armory here in Stockholm, and they have about 600,000 people who pass through their doors on any given year. They have shared with us the images within their collection, and last year alone those were viewed 60 million times. It is a truly powerful thing when you share your history with the world. It is also an enduring thing. So I know that all of you come from archives that have tremendously well-resourced and attention to detail and lots of love and care for the things that you do, but history as it is, is ephemeral and fragile. 
This is an image of the Trinity Cathedral in St. Petersburg taken as it was undergoing restoration and burning and losing history. What we think of as our national monuments, what we think of as enduring aspects of our society are, of course, when we care for them, enduring. But nonetheless, we never know how the world will change. And by putting things out there into the world, we know that it has greater longevity than when we hold it close to ourselves. If it isn't digital, if it isn't shared, ultimately, as our punch cards will tell us, I don't know if there's anybody from the punch card um, community here, IBM or anything like that in the room, ultimately it will fade away. And we lose information at a greater, almost at a greater rate than we actually are generating it at this point. So sharing it, putting it out there is a powerful way of ensuring that it endures long into the future and far beyond the knowledge that's contained in this room. And finally, because I was encouraged to talk about this, it is also a clever thing. As many of you know, it is strongly discouraged to edit your articles on Wikipedia. And since I was speaking a little bit about the importance of having articles on Wikipedia and the power that it plays in telling the story, we do not encourage people to edit their own articles on Wikipedia. And this is because we have strong policies around conflict of interest. There is an article about me on Wikipedia. I wouldn't edit it because it's very hard to be neutral about oneself. And neutrality is a critical part of the way that Wikipedia works. And so when I say it is a clever thing, it is because one can quickly get into quicksand if one tries to edit one's own article, but by putting information out there in the public, you have now created a tremendous resource for others to tell your story about you and make sure that that information is accurate and make sure that that information is appropriate and historical and timely and well-researched. Because as we know and as we have heard, in a post-fact world, this is actually truly important that the, right, that the truthful stories are being told. So it is clever. It is smart. And how can you be open, right? I've been standing here encouraging you to be open, but I recognize it's more difficult than it sounds. I would invite you to let us help you share your story. And when I say us, I don't mean Wikipedia. There is, and I, I hate to use the metaphor of an army, but there is an army of people who believe in free knowledge and sharing, an army of curators and researchers and archivists who want to help you do this, who want to bring your stories out there to the world. They want to join you in the conversation and make sure that things are well represented. Believe me, they are fact-based. They want to make sure that things are accurate and right. Publish under free licenses. Invite in the curators. You have wonderful collections. Take a look at what it is that you can offer to the world, to the commons, open licensing. Let us, the millions, help. This is an image of the golden record from the Voyager mission. The Voyager mission left Earth in 1977. It is currently the furthest away man-made object from our planet. It contains a record of things that we felt as a society, as a, as a global society, were important at the time. Your legacies are history. They are inextricably bound, as I said earlier. You hold our history in your hands. They are bound in one. When you open us them up to the world, you will understand yourselves better, and we will understand you better. We will be able to tell a story that is not just that, that exists in the textbooks, and is not just that of the politics of our nations, but is that of the economic power that businesses play in shaping our worlds, in building our societies, in creating livelihood in understanding the way that commerce and trade have affected the world. These are important things. They tell us what it is that humanity has valued over time. I urge you, I encourage you to think about how you can be more open because there is such tremendous wealth to be shared and we are so eager to help you share it. You'll find that it is a little bit difficult at first, but it comes with greater authenticity, and with greater authenticity comes greater trust and greater respect, and I don't know how anybody could be against that. <laughs> that feels like a very good thing. And because the metaphorical cliff plunge works really well, <laughs> I do encourage you all to think about what that like, Summoning what that courage might be and what stepping off that cliff might take, even if it is just a first try, even if it's just the first open curation, even if it's inviting the first researcher into the room to think about how we could work better together. There's so much opportunity, and I just want to say thank you again for having me here to tell you a little bit or share a little bit of my perspective about it with a slight provocation for where you might go. So with that, thank you. 
And I believe it's time for some Q&A. Questions from the audience, and I'll actually kick off with the first one, so you can all start thinking about them. Um, you talked about the, um, the black hole yes. of information from the 20th century. Could you expand a little bit on that? Because sure. there, when there's a black hole, some actors tend to f try to fill it, and others are <laughs> void. Oh, yes, we yes. were speaking about this a little bit before the presentation. Um, so the black hole of history is not, not a concept from Wikimedia. It's actually a concept from the cultural sector, and it refers to the fact that uh, up until a certain point, and as again it changes country by country, uh, content that falls out of copyright falls into the public domain, and that's actually a wonderful thing. Um, it's many places, that's how copyright's designed to work, limited terms to incentivize creation because there's value in it, and then ultimately all of that learning and, uh, and understanding is meant to enrich our, our societies as a whole. Um, what has happened is that as copyright terms have been extended, and particularly across the European continent, because every country has sort of a patchwork of copyright and there's not necessarily a unified understanding, this is meant for the creation, this is made for the creation of many orphan works where we don't necessarily understand full licensing ownership, and it means that because institutions and in general, tend to be conservative, rather than release boldly, people have withheld. And what that has meant is that there's quite limited information. Now, the question that Anders is getting at is, because jurisdictions are quite different, there is a tendency in the country that I am from, in the United States, to be quite a bit bolder about what it means to release information. And so quite a lot of the history of the rest of the world is actually being released by companies in the United States, which means that the black hole of history isn't just something that exists, it also is something that's being mediated by cultures that are different than the ones that have actually created that cultural content. So of all the content that exists within copyright, much of it is still locked away, but some of the things that are being released are the things that are being um, curated and decided upon in countries far, far away from their original point of origin. And what I would say is that that is, a, that is sad because there is an opportunity for each of us within our own societies to better understand what is something that is of value than somebody who sits in another place far away in another city who speaks a different language, who lacks the familiarity with the culture to say, actually, this is something that is important. Actually, this is something that should be preserved because otherwise we end up with a hegemonic understanding of history, and that actually is a tremendous loss. Thank you. We had a question over there. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Frederik Massen. I'm from a Danish uh, company. Uh, just uh, one comment to the last thing and then a question um, about the black hole. Um, I think, uh, yes, there's a copyright issue, but an another issue that we are confronted with in, in our archives is uh, the issue of uh, protection protection of uh, personal uh, information. And uh, right now in uh, the EU, there's a new legislation coming into force next year, GDPR it's called, and uh, not even are we not able to, uh, public, to public any kind of personal uh, things from our archives. The real problem is that we can be forced to destroy uh, quite a lot of our archives. We are a service provider and we, uh, all our history is linked to our frontliners. So we have a lot about our frontliners in, in our archives. And uh, if it goes the way as it seems right now, we can be yeah, forced to, to destroy that, uh, that information. Um, and I think that's definitely something we should maybe in a later session talk about. <clears throat> the, the question, uh, and I hope you can correct me, I hope I'm wrong. But um, we, we, are, we are business, Danish business, one, more, more than 100 years old, and uh, we have branches in uh, 40 countries around the world. <clears throat> and we uh, would like to tell our story, which is very much Danish, on Wikipedia in all the different countries where we are present. And we felt that when we contacted Wikipedia in their national language, with our national Danish uh, history, for instance, in Poland or the US or whatever around the world, we felt um, some kind of resistance mm. from Wikipedia when we came as a company and wanted to upload 
our history, and of course, it's our way of looking at our history. Uh, so, it, yeah, as you already said, when you tell about your own story, it's, it, it is your own story. But just to, when I hear you s encourage us to to tell and be open about our history, we felt from from that this was not what we were 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 meant by by Wikipedia when we contacted Wikipedia locally around the world. I, I think that that's probably true, and I'm sorry to hear that that's been the case. Historically, we have a much greater capacity and experience working with public institutions. I mentioned a few of those where there is a common understanding because historically many people within those institutions have come over to contribute to Wikipedia and many Wikipedians come from those institutions. I think that they're, part of the reason that I'm here is that I do believe that there's some lack of understanding of the role that you play within preserving and understanding the history of the private sector from the Wikimedia community. And so I'm here to sort of offer that hand for that first conversation, because I do think that there's something that can be done as part of education within our own community about the importance of this, but it does require from both sides a willingness and an openness to have that conversation. The very first time we sat down with the public institution, I can tell you, they didn't necessarily have the greatest experience either, um, just being quite honest in disclosure, uh, because historically, as, a, as an internet organization, we didn't necessarily know how to take that step forward. Through, through practice, we have now tremendous strong partnerships with many leading cultural institutions around the world. And I, the reason, as I said, that part of the reason I'm here to have this conversation is I think there's opportunity. And it will require some learning and it will require that holding of breath before we take that jump. But I think we can get there and I appreciate you asking the question. Um. And you already touched upon this, but maybe we can go back to it. So we have corporate interests, and then we have society, societal interests. As a society, we want to share all, our whole story, um, but corporate interests back off against that. Are there any experiences working with the companies that are active on Wikipedia or are they active? Any success stories or, or failures that we should be aware of? <laughs> Um, in the U.S., you have the whole, uh, 150 years ago, the whole slave industry uh, and how that connects to today's companies or universities. In Europe, we have what did you do during the war question. In Sweden, if you're a company that works up north, you have the question, what have you done with the ethnic minorities up north? Mm -hmm. How should you, and you talked a little bit about letting your ghosts out of the, the closet, uh, let the air them, but any more thoughts on that? I mean, we have found over time that efforts to withhold information usually are not effective. Uh, there's a term for this, we call it the Streisand effect, which actually refers <laughs> to Barbara Streisand, who uh, at one point tried to withhold images of one of her houses uh, and have them taken off the internet. And of course, by doing so, it created a lot of attention and then the images were everywhere. That is the nature of the internet today. Um, one of the reasons that we advocate for openness and uh, access to records is that it allows for information to be accurately represented. Wikimedians, in particular, but the open knowledge community in general, consider themselves to be rigorous adherence to truth and veracity. In fact, the, the thing about being told that you have something wrong on Wikipedia is that people really like it because then they have something to fix. Um, and so the opportunity to work to understand the history of institutions, the opportunity to work to work through those difficult periods in an institution's history is something that we really value. You made reference earlier to the, um, to the nature of disclosure. One of the things that I think not just Wikipedia knows, but society as a whole and any good public relations or communications professional will tell you is that by sharing things out in the forefront and working with how you actually, um, working in public and working proactively to tell some of those stories uh, actually is a greater opportunity to frame the conversation around disclosure and learning than it is around some of the difficulties. So we have examples of where things have not gone so well. Politicians are regularly caught editing their Wikipedia articles, and I can tell you it never works in their favor. Um, organizations that work more in the open tend to have far greater success stories. Great. Any last questions? One over there. 
Georg Riegele from Austria. Uh, do you think Wikipedia will never fade away? <laughs> um, I certainly hope it doesn't. I have to recognize that every single digital medium, or every single medium rather, changes over time. We at the Wikimedia Foundation, that's actually our role, is to preserve Wikipedia for the future and in perpetuity. And one of the things that we're doing in this regard is actually setting up an endowment fund to protect it for eternity. I think that one of the things that makes Wikipedia so powerful is that it does change in response to the world around it. I tend to think of it as a living organism. External stimuli create a reaction, and that reaction is an adaptability reaction. Um, I do believe that there's something tremendously powerful in a distributed network of information. It is obviously quite precocious to say 16 years on that will endure as half as long as some of the institutions represented in this room. But one of the strengths of our model and one of the reasons I call it to be something that is enduring as it is, is that it is distributed now to have many places outside of any one central point of control. And that distribution tends to be very powerful as a mechanism for long-term preservation. In fact, that distribution is what has allowed us to preserve history over time. I didn't use this example in the presentation, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fact that had the knowledge of the Greek philosophers never been distributed to Baghdad, we would have lost all of it. Um, it is true that distribution of knowledge and history and records is something that allows us to preserve. And so even if Wikipedia disappears, I am very confident that the content within it will endure for a very long time. Thank you. One question here. Hi, hi there. I'm Tracy Panic, Levi Strauss and Company. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I'm a little curious to get more information about the images that you talked about and the process mm -hmm. that you went through with the British Museum to post mm -hmm. images. It was uh, enlightening to hear about that. Uh, thank you so much for your question. I, as an organization that's based in San Francisco, I'm sure you have tremendous records that we would love to have on Wikipedia um, that would help us understand the city that we are based in. Uh, so the, the process that we've gone through with many of these museums, we actually just worked on a project with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is the third largest encyclopedic museum in the world, a tremendous collection. And they have almost all of the things that exist within their collection are actually in the public domain, but the images that represent those items in the collection are not because they're relatively new images. And so we worked with them to release those images to the public under an open license so those images could be used. Now, a public domain license means that it's out there, it doesn't necessarily require attribution, but some of the images that you've seen in there, you will have noticed, all had attribution to them. And so of the limited images that do exist on Wikipedia of brands and corporate heritage and history, I actually found some from Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola that all come from those archives. They're just very limited in number. So what a potential opportunity would be would be to say, to go through your collections and look at what you believe has value both in terms of telling your story but also in terms of sharing the context in the world in which your organization came from, the history of its founding, the environment that it was founded at the time. I heard a story yesterday I was talking in, I believe, um, with the History Factory about how uh, Fireman's Fund has some of the greatest images of San Francisco prior to the great 1906 earthquake and then after the 1906 earthquake. So, I'm sorry, my alarm's going off. <laughs> um, so some of those images have tremendous importance, not just to the organization that created or them or owns the rights to them, but also the, the context of the city or the culture or the, the country. So an opportunity would be to go through those archives and look at what sort of value you think that they might offer and then consider how you might license them. So it could be entirely possible for Levi Strauss, for example, to still be the producer of those images. You don't have to release that right, but then offer them as an, um, an open licensed image so that any time it was shared, it was attributed back to you, but that copyright was, was one for attribution and could be reused more broadly. So that comes, there are a set of open license images called Creative Commons licenses that give different forms of, of, um, of licensing rights out and put them out into the public, whether it's for attribution or for non-commercial purposes, um, or you can use it, but there can't be any derivatives, it can't be 
uh, altered in any way. And I'd be more than happy to speak with anybody who's interested about that because that's a powerful way of releasing visual history with that, while still maintaining some degree of, um, of attribution and agency in doing so. Alexander. Thank you very much, Catherine, for uh, this very interesting and enlightening presentation. Um, I have a, a question in uh, regard and in view of um, the changing attitudes of uh, different generations towards all um, these electronic media outlets and also search sites like Google. Um, I have um, to deal with uh, a lot of young people who come to our archives for, our, for, for their research. And, um, of course, the, the notion of uh, Google and of all these um, Silicon Valley companies and how they are perceived by the people has changed tremendously because many of these companies are actually not very open and transparent, even though they demand a lot of openness and transparency from uh, companies like some of them which are uh, assembled here in, the, in, this, uh, in this hall. And um, I was just wondering whether, um, whether um, Wikimedia Foundation has a specific stance or a policy how to deal with these fears also, um, which there are about um, these very large companies sometimes who control many aspects of our daily lives nowadays. That's a great question. Um, as an organization that is both that receives quite a lot of our traffic from searches, for example, on Google, we also feel the tension between the importance of, the pro of how it makes information available and, and also sort of the control that it has. Um, I can say that the Wikimedia Foundation takes an approach that is very much committed to neutrality and privacy. And the reason I say that is that for example, we collect very little information about anybody who comes to our sites, and we discard that information as soon as legally, um, as soon as as soon as we are legally allowed to do so. Uh, we believe that this sort of thing is actually important, and it's part of our overall values because we believe that an institution like there should be space for an institution like Wikipedia in the internet today, one that is non-commercial, one that has more in. in um, common with a library than, than, for example, a search engine. Uh, and the reason that we believe this is because we believe that there, that allows us to be more of a neutral platform for information sharing. And while there's certainly nothing that we have against commercial interests, we actually think they're fantastic. Um, there's, there's, I'm, that's always something that our founder, Jimmy Wales, has been very clear on. We do believe that there's something important in having some sort of common platform that everyone can come to from sort of an equal perspective where there isn't necessarily one institution that has more control over the public narrative than the other. And particularly today, given the power that these platforms have for information sorting, distribution, the way that algorithms play a role in information sharing, we think that there's something quite critical in having a place where that doesn't exist and where we're quite transparent that that, that doesn't exist so that people know what it is that they're seeing, they know why it is that they're seeing it, the origins of that information are transparent, there are citations back to where it came from, and that they know that as they browse, and as they engage with that knowledge, we're not copying, tracking, sharing, or using it to serve you anything else. We're just here to help you learn. Thank you. I'm uh, David Hay from um, BT, British Telecommunications. Um, it's interesting what you said about um, uh, relationship with commercialization of, of the stuff. Um, many of us working in uh, for businesses, um, we are under constant encouragement to commercialize our archives. Um, and so although we've got a lot of stuff out there on Creative Commons license, we also do deals with people like Ancestry mm -hmm. um, and, and people like that. So what would you say to a hard-nosed finance director who, who says to you, well, these are just another asset and we've got to make use of them for the benefit of our stakeholders and customers? I think that this, it's a conversation we have all the time with institutions. So I'm actually, I managed, used the example of the Metropolitan Museum earlier. I think that they were earning around a half a million in licensing fees from licensing their connect collection and publishing it on, um, you know, on tote bags and on postcards and the like. And ultimately, the decision that they made and what they realized was that it is in greater, it is was 
in their interest for their brand and their content to be out there in a way that created a more universal story that was building greater affinity with users uh, in bringing them into the organization and institution as lifelong customers, if you will, of that institution or patrons in the nature of the museum. I think that there have been some studies that have quantified the importance of the commons as both from a creative perspective but also in terms of being able to build those relationships. And while I am not a marketing expert per se, certainly as Wikimedia we've done quite a lot of research to understand the importance of having brand and brand assets out there to be publicly used in the world. Um, I think it is an interesting question. I think it probably depends on the individual use case, and that's where it would be great to have that conversation on a one-to-one -one basis. What we have found is that there's a tremendous value in creating that brand affinity that perhaps is longer lasting than any one revenue deal. Now, I think that's different for every model of every institution, and it certainly could be the case that you choose to do so, as you said, to share some things on a limited basis that are part of your collection um, within Creative Commons and then monetize certain assets until that there's less value to them and then release them to the public. I mean, we are believers that it should all be open because there's greater value in openness. Um, but you know, I think that every organization sort of has to assess what makes the most sense to them to have that sustainability mechanism. Thank you so much. Um, I see nothing else. And we just want to say a big thanks to Catherine for coming here uh, and also for extending that hand. So if we as companies or as business archivists take that leap of faith, uh, remember on the other hand, side at Wikipedia, there is a lot of learning going on as well. So we'll be taking the, the plunge together. Thank you. Thanks again, Catherine. Thank you so much.